Okay. Um, well, for the last three talks, we've been talking about discipleship, and uh, it would be relatively easy to think that the talks were for everybody else in the room, but not necessarily for you. And so today's talk is exactly the opposite of that. Uh, today's talk is actually not for anyone else in the room. Uh, today's talk is just for you. So we're going to personalize everything that we've been learning uh, from the Word of God. And we're going to start with a, a verse from Philippians. And, um, you know, it's useful to, to just bear in mind that the book of Philippians, which is such an encouraging book, was written from a Roman prison cell. And um, it probably wasn't very comfortable. And yet, in these circumstances, the Apostle Paul is writing these hugely encouraging words. I'll just read the first few verses from Philippians 1. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. If you look at almost any of the letters from the Apostle Paul, uh, verse 2 of chapter 1 is pretty much identical. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. So we're going to look this morning at progressing with Christ. Not enough just for us to say, I'm going to be a believer in the Lord Jesus. We've got to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus and follow Jesus uh, in our lives. Now, I do want to qualify that with just one little story. The thief on the cross arrived at the gates of heaven. And the angel on the gate said, who are you? And he said, I was the thief on the cross next to Jesus. And he said, um, so did you go to the synagogue then? No. Um, how much time did you spend in prayer? I really just did the one prayer. Um, did you spend a lot of time reading your Bible? No. Um, okay, so did you help people? Well, no, I robbed them. How long were you a Christian? Uh, about an hour and a half. So what are you doing here? Jesus said I could come. Jesus said I could come. Then in you come. Now, I say that to qualify things because for most of us, we're going to live our Christian lives for more than an hour and a half. <laughs> and, uh, and there will be opportunity for service and for advancement and so on. But I need to qualify that, that it's that heaven is not, is not for those as a reward for Christian service. Christian service is an obligation because of what we're going to get in heaven. It's that way round, okay? And if you find when you get to heaven, and this might happen to you, that in your street, your mansion has got the thief on the cross living on one side of you, and the centurion that executed Jesus on the other side of you, if you've got a problem with that, you've misunderstood the grace of God. So we're only there by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. So against that background, though, I want you, not everybody else, just you to think, yes, but what does the Lord want me to do? What does the Lord want me to do next? Okay, so let's talk about 
uh, progress because most of us, hopefully, are going to be Christians for more than an hour and a half. Okay, progressing with Christ. Um, I took this picture here. Um, this, is, this is like Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch, and they're, they're on the chariot, and they're on a journey. But the journey that that uh, Ethiopian was on was a much more, in, more important journey than just the journey from Jerusalem back to Africa. It was a journey to get to know the Lord. And he made huge advances on that journey in only a few hours. Really quite exciting. Okay, so progressing with Christ. Forgive me, I'm going to deliver a lot of this talk when you're looking at the back of my head, but that's just the way it is when I haven't got a handbag mirror. Okay, we start at the cross. Everything starts at the cross. Until we understand the cross, we haven't begun the journey. And so we behold the cross, and there we see the Lord Jesus Christ paying the price for our sins. And when we accept his offer of forgiveness, the journey is just beginning. But he who has begun a good work in you will complete it. Okay, so we then got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the Bible says we should consider being baptized. Remember we were talking about the commission that Jesus gave at the end of Matthew chapter 28. And he says, go into all the world and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So a, a simple next stage is to go public on our faith and to be baptized. And then we should begin to serve. Because remember what Jesus said. He said that hearing the word, you're building your house on the sand. Doing the word, well, that's where the blessing lies. That's going to make it foundational. That will make you secure. You're building your house on the rock. So it's not just about hearing the word, it's about acting on it. Uh, so beginning to serve, we need to learn to bear one another's burdens. It's about building up fellowship and about making yourself available to others. And then it's about reaching out to those that don't know the Lord Jesus, bringing others to faith. And you in turn making others disciples, getting alongside them. And then, of course, finally... There will come a day where we'll wake up in the morning here on earth and before the day is out, we'll see the Lord Jesus Christ face to face. Where are you on the journey? And are you, I'm not talking to anyone else, and are you ready to move on to the next stage in your walk with the Lord Jesus Christ? Um, I had an argument one time with the head of drilling of BP. And I said to him, why is it that every time I come to BP with a technical solution to one of your problems, you always say, we'll put that to the next meeting and then I never hear about it again. And he said this, but it was really interesting. It's a good analogy for here. He said, because it's like fixing a hole in the roof. He said, <laughs> when it's raining, you don't want to, and when it's sunny, you don't need to. And so there's always a good reason to delay moving forward to the next stage. But we need to be very careful about that. Don't put the Lord off. Okay, so we're starting the journey of faith. Let's have a look at this together then. So if we're starting the journey of faith, three things that we really absolutely need to know. And the three things we need to know is that God made the world. So it's his. And everybody in it, the psalmist says. And then that God loved the world. Now, that's not like love that you might have for your children or that you might have for your parents. It's much, much, much stronger love than that. Greater love has no man than this, said Jesus, that a man lay down his life for his friends. But why should God even care about this, Psalm 8 says, you know? But he doesn't even just care about this, he loves us with an overwhelming love, and that's what you need to tap into, understanding that. And then God saved. 
the world. See, it wasn't enough for sin just to be overlooked. Sin had to be overcome. It wasn't that God wanted to reduce evil in the world. He wanted to remove evil from the world. He wasn't just going to divert evil. He was going to destroy evil. And so he came himself and took the worst of the injustice and the worst of the pain and the suffering on himself so that we could have a relationship with him. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. If you can absorb that and believe that and put your faith in that, that's what will bring you into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It starts at the cross. Um, here's some things that will not save you. Now, I don't want you to be offended by this, but this is very important because if you're not a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you might think that one of these or a few of these together are going to get you enough points to just get you over the line and get you into heaven. And the Bible says it's none of these going to do it. Okay, so living a good life and helping old ladies across the road is very commendable, but is not going to save you. If the thief on the cross had arrived at the gates of heaven and said, well, actually, I lived a really good life for 40 years, the angel would have said, I'm really sorry, but the gates are not open for you. He just said, Jesus said I could come. Being religious is not going to get you to heaven. Studying theology is not going to get you to heaven. I told you that Ian phoned me up when he went to St. Andrews and he said, Dad, there's people here who've read the Bible all their lives and they don't know Jesus. And I said, no, I know, son. And he was really shocked at that. It's not enough to have head knowledge. It's got to go into your heart. Now, oddly enough, believing in God will not get you into heaven. It's not enough. Muslims believe in God. The devil believes in God. But have you actually accepted God's way of salvation? There, there's no other lifeboat. All the other religions in the world, they, they, you can respect them, you know, that there may be noble attempts by men to reach out to God. Jesus is God's way of reaching out to us. <laughs> there's no other lifeboat. There's no other name under heaven given amongst men whereby we must be saved. Believing in God is not enough. Even learning about the Bible is not enough. When I was 12 years old, I could recite whole sections of Scripture because, basically because of chocolate. Well, at our children's meeting, you see, if you could recite a chapter from the Bible, you'd get a bar of, I'm giving away my age here, five boys' chocolate. Does that mean anything to... Oh, there's a few people you, never heard of it. Never heard of it. Aye, right. So, Five Boys Chocolate was the reason that I could stand up and say passages from, from the King James Version I did not understand. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manner, spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, who being the express image of his person, <laughs> I had no idea what that meant. But I got the chocolate. On its own, you see, that's not going to save you. Even serving in the church is not going to save you. I remember going on one of the uh, scheme mission that we were on, and, and I got to one door, and a chap said to me, I don't need this, he said, because I was in the church choir. I didn't know how to answer it at the time. Um, talking like a Christian is not going to get you into heaven. And even being christened or baptized is not going to get you into heaven. These are all distractions that can make people think that they're saved, and they're not saved. It starts at the cross. 
The journey has to start at the cross where Jesus died. And we need to ask God for forgiveness. And when we do that, you need to admit that you need it. You need to believe that he will forgive you. And when you do, you'll be cleansed completely in his sight. See, the Bible doesn't say that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. It doesn't just say that. It then says, and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. When Jesus went to the cross, he didn't just pay the price for your sins. He took the blame for your sins. You're never going to get your head around that. But he's cleansed you from all unrighteousness. And if you put your trust in Jesus, when God looks on you, he sees the Lord Jesus Christ. And he sees you as pure and as perfect and ready to be a son as he is. And and that's just mind-blowing. And you will receive his love and you'll begin a personal relationship with him. It's transformational. Here's some reasons to delay that, though. Um, apathy says, well, I don't want to be disturbed. You know, I'm, I'm, I've got a busy life and uh, I'm quite happy in my life. I don't want to hear all this stuff about getting connected with God. Fear says, I don't want to encounter God. Could be a bit scary. It's funny, actually, that when, when people do come face to face with God in their first relationship with him, what overwhelms them is his love. Not his power. Because goodness me, if God was to reveal his power to people that just came to know him, it would be terrifying. It's his love that is overwhelming. And then pride says, I don't want to have been wrong. I was chatting to a chap just last week, actually, in our church. and His his wife's a believer. And for the last five or six years, uh, Andrew's been, pray for him, Andrew, his name is. Um, He's been struggling with how confident his wife is in Jesus Christ. And he started out with all the usual questions, you know, what about the dinosaurs? You know, um, and, uh, you know, doesn't string theory explain how the universe got here? I don't know. But he's, he's, he was at that stage at the beginning, and then slowly he's begun to realize that actually the truth of the gospel is the true truth. But he he said, I I can't let go. I said, are you still standing on the diving board, Andrew? He says, no, I'm hanging off the end of the diving board by my fingernails. I said, well, I'm not going to push you, but there's going to come a day when you're going to have to decide what you're going to do. And he said to me, I don't want to have been wrong for 65 years. You know, I can relate to that. Yeah, I can accept that. Okay, so what's the next stage then? Because if you've believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, what does Jesus say? Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm going to be very controversial here and say that if you know that you are a believer, there is no reason to delay being baptized. In the New Testament, 3,000 people became Christians And what happened next? They were baptized. So, you have to ask yourself the question that the Ethiopian asked to Philip, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Now, you see if you can come up with a good answer for that one. And then if you are truly a believer, uh, let's see if you've got the courage to take it to the next stage. Now, I'm just going to explain a little bit about baptism. Jesus was baptized. Now, why would he be baptized? Because when John the Baptist came, when he was baptizing people, he was baptizing them to sort of illustrate that they were washing away the wickedness of their old life and then stepping up into a new life, you know, rededicating themselves to God. And that's great. So why would Jesus need to do that? Well, I never really understood that until I went to Israel. And I was shocked. Back in the day when Jesus was baptized, the River Jordan was filthy. 
I mean, seriously, seriously filthy. All the villages, all the way from Galilee, all the way down to Jericho, the sewage used to go into the River Jordan. They didn't have sewage treatment schemes. Now, I want to, I want to just show you on this map here that up here, on the, there's the Sea of Galilee up there, and the Jordan flows in from Dan up here near the Lebanese border into the Sea of Galilee, and it's nice and clean up there. You can drink the water. And all the way down here, you've got Tiberias, you've got Capernaum, you've got Magdala over here, you've got Beth Shan uh, down here, and all these villages coming down here, all tipping their sewage into Jordan. So when Naaman was told, go and baptize yourself in the River Jordan, he said, there's no way, there's no way I'm going in there. It stinks. And his servant said to him, you know, if you'd been asked to do something expensive or something complicated or challenging, you'd have done it. All you're being asked to do is dip yourself in some sewage, you know. And eventually he took his coat off and he dipped himself seven times in the River Jordan. He came up and he was healed of his leprosy. He went in unclean. He came out of the water clean. Okay. Where Jesus was baptized was even further down the sewage. <laughs> and when Jesus went into the river, John was shocked. And he said, surely, Lord, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus said, no, I want you to baptize me to fulfill all righteousness. And in his purity, Jesus was lowered down into this filthy water and he came up with it stinking all over his body and running through his hair. And the picture was the opposite way around. Can you see that? I don't know if you can see, but the color of the water in the River Jordan is not the sort of water that you really want to be baptized in. And that's after they put in the sewage works, right? And our Lord was submerged in that water. And when he came up with all that filth running all down his body, heaven opened and God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. See, we symbolize baptism by us leaving the sin and the guilt behind us. Jesus went in in his purity and came out with all that filth all over him. And it was such a wonderful picture of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. Surely it's not too much for him to ask then that we go public on our faith and are baptized to show that we've left that sinful life behind and we've risen to newness of life. Okay, here's some good reasons to delay your baptism then. Because Satan will always give you some reasons uh, to delay. So uh, apathy says, I'll think about it a bit longer. Now, uh, fear says, I'm not good enough yet. <laughs> Have you had that one? I became a Christian when I was 14. And, uh, and six months later, I was baptized. It should have been six hours later. Yeah. But I, I really was I, was, I was obsessed with this idea that I can't, I can't go up to the front of the church and, you know, be dipped in, the, in the, the tank at the front of Bellevue Chapel. Me? I mean, my parents had been called into the school about my behavior only a few months earlier. I'm not proud of it, but I was a work in progress. That's a euphemism. Pride says, I don't want people to think I'm a fanatic. <laughs> it is amazing how a baptism service is one of the greatest testimonies to people who don't know the Lord Jesus. Now, my little grandson, Ben, uh, said to his daddy uh, about two years ago, um, I've asked the Lord Jesus into my heart. And his daddy said, are you sure? And he said, yes, I'm really, really sure. And then about, about a month later, he said, oh, I want to be baptized. And his dad said, well, we'll, we'll get it organized for you. You know, and he agonized over whether Ben was really serious about his Christian faith. He said, I'll tell you what, once you're 11, we'll, we'll baptize you. On his 11th birthday, dad, do you remember you said that I could tell everybody about me trusting in Jesus? I'll tell you, I've never been at such a moving service. I mean, I'm his granddad. What would you expect? 
But Alice and I went down for his baptism service, and in the row behind us were all his school pals, none of whom knew the Lord. And he'd made out a little poster, come to my baptism, and here's the address. He misspelled address, but... <laughs> It's okay, it's okay, his pal still got there, right? And one of them has actually started going to the church. So it's a wonderful thing to do, to go public on your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So I ask you the question again, that you need to ask yourself seriously today, if you're going to make progress with the Lord, what would hold you back from being baptised? Because none of these are actually valid, right? It's not about being good enough. It's about Jesus being good enough. Trust me, he's good enough. Okay. It's a public declaration of faith in Jesus. So I'll read to you again. Acts 2 verse 41. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. So when it says that day, how long was the delay between them trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ and being baptized? So, controversial, but it's in the Bible. I can show you. Okay, so what about progress beyond that then? Okay. You need a formula, don't you? For any kind of progress. Well, here's our formula. Prayer plus practice equals progress. So you go to the Lord and you say, just like the Apostle Paul, Lord what would thou have me to do? I'm really sorry that every time I quote the scriptures, I quote the authorised version, and that's got more to do with Five Boys Chocolate than it is to do with my <laughs> spirituality. And I apologise for that, but hey, you, just, you should learn it, right? We should all speak to each other in Elizabethan English. Prayer plus practice equals progress. So simple, isn't it? And the Lord Jesus said, if you hear the word and you don't do it, it's like building your house on the sand. And if you hear the word and you do do it, it's like building your house on the rock. It's that simple. That's the foundational side. This is head knowledge. Okay. Now, you'll be able to think of all sorts of barriers. And with God, there are no insurmountable barriers. Let me just say that again. This is so important that we understand this. With God, there are no insurmountable barriers. I am a mariner. So my answer to the flood would have been build a boat. Yeah, it's a good idea. I totally agreed with God's decision to get Noah to build a boat. And then it all went haywire after that. Because when they were trapped on the shores of the Dead Sea, if God had just asked my advice, which he never seems to do, I would have said, well, Lord, you need a boat. And God said, no, I don't need a boat. He said, I'll just blow the sea out of the way. I wouldn't have come up with that. Right? I have to say, it didn't cross my mind. Right. And so Jonah is told, go to Nineveh. And he goes in the opposite direction. He gets, he gets on a, a boat that's going to Spain. And there's a big storm and everything. He gets thrown over the side. And, and of course, if God had asked my advice, I would say, well, Lord, it's obvious. You need a boat. God says, no, I don't need a boat. I'm going to send a big fish. I'll swallow him up, take him back to the shore, vomit him up on the shore, and then I'll send him back to the I wouldn't have come up with that either. I'll be honest with you. Elisha, he's building, he's building a school for the prophets, and one of them takes a swing at a tree, and he misses the tree, and the axe flies out of his hand. axe head comes off lands in the water, and it's sunk. What do you need? You need a boat with a magnetometer, don't you? It's so obvious. And God says, no, I don't need a boat. What we'll do is we'll throw a stick in, and the stick will sink, and the iron axe head will float to the surface. I think it would take a lot of faith to throw that stick in. 
Right. In the New Testament, Jesus is out in the Sea of Galilee. A storm comes in. I mean, storms come in just about every night in the Sea of Galilee because the desert up above the Golan Heights gets very cold and the cold air comes rushing down. And you see all the fishermen today with their outboards out <laughs> trying to get back into Tiberias before the storm comes. This was a particularly bad one, though. Experienced fishermen thought they were dying. And they turn to Jesus and they shout at him, Master, do you not care if we perish? And if the Lord had asked my advice, I would have said, well, you need a bigger boat. And God says, no, I don't need a boat. I'll just calm the storm. There are no insurmountable <coughs> barriers when we are doing the will of God. You're actually invincible when you're going about the will of God. Nothing can stop you, despite what you might fear. You've got God himself on your side. Numbers, chapter 12. Let's go up and take the land, says Caleb. Oh, but you should see the size of the guys that are up there. They're big. They've got fortified cities. All sorts of reasons why they shouldn't do it. Well, they delayed the whole project by 40 years because of a lack of faith, thinking that somehow God couldn't overcome the barriers that were ahead of them. Imagine yourself as one of the generals in the Battle of Jericho, and you've just spent six days walking around the walls being laughed at. And Joshua gathers all the generals together, and they say, now, what do you want us to do tomorrow? Well, here's what we're going to do tomorrow. Instead of walking around the walls, once we're going to walk around the walls six times. Uh-huh. And how's, how's, that going to, how's that going to take the city of Jericho? Well, just, just trust me. Just bear with me on this one, says Joshua. We're going to walk around the walls Six times, and then on the seventh time, we're going to blow lots of trumpets. And then God will send angels and will push the walls over. Right, off we go. There are no insurmountable barriers to us when we're serving the Lord. So don't go telling God, well, I'm not good enough, or, uh, you know, I've, I've, I've got a speech impediment. That was Moses' one, you know, or Gideon says, well, I'm not important enough, you know. If God calls you to service, he'll give you everything you need to carry out that service. And every barrier in front of you will fall, and no, no weapon forged against you shall prevail. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. If you'd been there in the Valley of Elah, 1 Samuel 17, and you saw that guy, and you saw that guy, you wouldn't be taking bets. Because you would be thinking, this is an impossible situation. The reality is that Goliath didn't stand a chance that day. The poor guy did not know what he was up against. And he thought he could laugh at David. And then one stone brought him down. Such a thing had never entered his head before. <laughs> oh, come on. It's better than that. All right. Haggai. Is it time for you to live in your panelled house as well? The house of the Lord right, lies in ruins. It's like I could go on and on about this, right? But all the way through Scripture, you see people with reasons why they can't go forward. And God's saying, but I've told you to go forward, so just do it. So what's holding us back? Well, is it apathy? Can be. Do you know, more often it's past failures. You've got a memory of something that happened 10 years ago or something like that. You think, well, I, I couldn't possibly. I couldn't possibly be a missionary in Gambia you know, because I did something awful when I was 12. Right? And, and Satan will try and persuade you that past failures are a good reason for you not to have future success. That's completely wrong. 
In fact, in some ways, I hate to say this, but past failures can help to qualify you for future success because you're going to be less dependent on you and more dependent on Jesus. Is it busyness? Is it overload? Is it distractions? Is it fear? Are there obstacles that you think are insurmountable? Is it intimidation? Or is it discouragement? Did somebody once say to you, you're no good? Or did somebody once say to you, look, I know you're trying your best, but that was, that was awful. Or did somebody ever say to you, as they said to me, don't pray in public until you can pray properly? That shut me up for three years. Yeah? Whatever it is that's holding you back, just get rid of it. All right. A um, little bit of encouragement from Hebrews. Lay aside every hindrance. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Consider him who endured such hostility that you may not grow weary or faint-hearted. You know, fear is a natural response. You think of everything that's going on in the world. People are frightened just now. But what if, what if... The ultimate source of power and authority was actually on our side. If you could see the Lord, you wouldn't be worried. Now, God, God can be emotional. He can be, he can be angry. He can be sad. He can be joyful. He can be all sorts of things, but he just, he just cannot be fearful. God, God is never fearful. It wasn't wrong of Jesus not to be frightened of the storm. It was just that the disciples were and they thought he should be. But then he just stood up and calmed the storm. And Psalm 23 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. The Lord's never going to abandon you, and he's going to give you everything you need to carry out his will. So why not ask him, Lord, what would thou have me to do? Does anybody know where that is? That's a main road in Ephesus. Pretty intimidating. And when Paul got there, Paul would have found it pretty intimidating. God wanted him to go and be an evangelist in the big Roman city. Well, he wrote to the church that was established there many years later. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. See, it's not about us. It's not about our abilities. It's all about his power and his abilities, and they are limitless. There was a gospel campaign uh, oh, a couple of centuries ago in Glasgow, and uh, 14 days of meetings. And at the end of it, they had a post-mortem. How come? How come, after all this work, there's only one convert, and he's 11, and he's a wee mill laddie from Blantyre? And they really thought that they'd completely missed the boat. Then actually, the mill laddie from Blantyre was David Livingston, who then led thousands to faith in the Lord. It's not about our strength. We don't need to worry about the numbers. That's not how we measure success. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Now, in the Old Testament, Satan used to use distractions that he couldn't use anymore. He used to give people false gods. I'll just tell you about a couple of them. So this is Sebek. And uh, Sebek is a crocodile. And incredibly, the greatest nation on earth at the time of Sebek, was the Egyptians, and they believed that he was the god of the Nile. And it was a distraction to the people of God that they actually wanted at one point to go back to Egypt because life was easier as a slave in Egypt where people worship this guy. It's incredible that people could be persuaded to believe that there was a crocodile in the Nile that was your god. This, the one in the middle, he's brilliant. You read about him where uh, uh, the Ark of the Lord is, is 
stolen by the Philistines. They put the ark into the Philistine temple. And it says the next day their big statue of Dagon, the god, had fallen forward and his head, his, his hands had broken off. And you think, well, why, why is his feet not broken off? He didn't have any feet. He was a fish. They believed in a fish. They believed in a fish. And they genuinely believed it. This was the God of the Canaanites. And he was a bull. And they believed in Moloch. He used to sacrifice children to Moloch. It's incredible. How can people be so naive as to be distracted? But honestly, Satan would have you believe in anything other than believe in the truth in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, in Ephesus, the big problem they had there was Artemis. And Artemis was a meteorite. She'd fallen out of the sky, so she must have come from heaven. And it was a kind of lumpy meteorite, so they decided that she looked like a female, possibly, uh, and decided that she was the goddess of the hunt. And that's what all the people in, in, in Ephesus were believing in. Satan will give you anything to distract you. Well, what about today? Well, the universe happened by itself. That's what our kids in the school will be taught, that nature is a product of nature. And they're supposed to believe it. We are the most intelligent beings in the universe. Yeah, right. We gained intelligence by good luck and enough time. So if you just create a pool of mud, you know, and you wait long enough, you'll get babies. It's, I mean, it is it's incredible what people will believe today. It's as naive as believing in a crocodile. Mankind can solve its own problems. Well, I'll tell you what, the pandemic has, has shown us a few things. And when you see wars and so on, and rumors of wars and all these other things, you realize actually we don't necessarily have all the answers ourselves. We can do whatever we want. It doesn't matter. Well, I've decided from now on, and I'm allowed to do this, I'm going to self-identify as a 25-year-old athlete. You may laugh, I have that right to self-identify as a 25-year-old athlete, and so that's what I am from now on. What are you laughing at? You can achieve anything you believe. It's not true. I, I applied for the Merchant Navy, and they said, you can't be a captain of a ship because you're deaf. I thought I could achieve anything, you know, if I really believed it. And so I never ended up as a captain of a ship. While we're talking about ships, have I run over my time again? Yeah? Okay. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your love and your mercy towards us. Then that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we pray, Father, that you will bless those that don't know you, that they'll have the courage to let go and let God have his way in their lives. And for those, Lord, that, that do know you, but perhaps haven't gone public on their faith in you, we pray that you'll give them the courage to be baptized. And we pray, too, that you'll bless them in their future walk with you. And we pray, Father, too, for those that are believers, are baptized, are ready to serve you. Lord, make clear to them what it is that you would have them do and help them to see that there are no insurmountable barriers for them because you are on their side. We thank you, Lord, for these simple thoughts today and pray that you'll challenge our hearts to serve you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you all very much. My